My guest today is Maria Victoria Albina, and she asks one very important question. Who is your favorite self? Who is your favorite self? Not your highest self or your best self, but the version of you that you like best. Is it the person that is stressed, anxious, overwhelmed, maybe mean or even cruel sometimes? Or is it the person who is cool, calm, collected, present, able to laugh at a joke and enjoy themselves? That's a bit of a rhetorical question, right? But more importantly, how do we achieve that state? And this is especially important for leaders, those of us who are in the business of caretaking for others or uh, being a manager of people, um, oftentimes, especially in the social impact space, community services, we are surrounded by really challenging situations. Uh, how do we create energetic boundaries to be able to, to experience that and still be okay? But Maria Victoria does something I think that's really brilliant and, and goes one step before that. And we talk about this idea of accepting really who we are. Uh, we talk about the stress cycle and um, we talk about identifying those stressors in our lives. Uh, we talk about safe spaces and um, this idea of what she calls emotional outsourcing, which uh, is akin to codependency, perfectionism, people pleasing. And um, let me tell you, it got a little emotional for me there uh, digging into these topics. We also had a lot of fun. Um, Maria is, uh, is someone who I, I'm now endeared to and really appreciate the work that she's done. Uh, Maria Victoria Albina is a master certified somatic life coach. She, she is a UC San Francisco trained family nurse practitioner and breathwork meditation guide with a passion for helping humans socialized as women realize that they are their own best healers by reconnecting with their bodies and their minds so they can break free from codependency, perfectionism, and people pleasing in order to reclaim their joy. Please welcome Maria Victoria Albina. Victoria, welcome. Thank you for joining me on the show. I really appreciate your time. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So when you say your body needs the opportunity to complete its stress cycle, mm -hmm. what does that mean for the uninitiated, uh, for people who are just like living in it and c continuously in it? What is actually completing a stress cycle mean? And what does it feel like when that happens? Yeah. So I think the best example on earth are little kids. So let's say they're on the playground and they fall and they hurt themselves and it really hurts. And they start sobbing and screaming. If they have a safe grown up to go to, they go running to them and they put their little hurt finger in your face and they tell you it hurts and they crawl in your lap if you're safe, right? Yeah. If they have that bond with you and they cry and they cry and they cry and then... <sighs> right? They release what we know is called the physiologic sigh. It's the nervous system resetting. And they stand up and they run off. And they're, they're fine. fine. Right. They're fine. What happened was there was a fright. And so in that moment of fright, their nervous system uh, went into what's called attachment cry, mm -hmm. uh, which is when the nervous system is saying, I'm not sure that I'm not about to die and I need someone bigger and safer than me to tell me that, that I'm going to live Yeah. because yeah. that's the nervous system job, particularly when we're little, right? Ages zero to seven is like, am I about to die right now? But that doesn't Please, go away no. when we get older, right? Oh, oh no, no. We're still on the lookout for lions, tigers, and bears. It had to be done. And I hope you'll forgive me, but lions, tigers, no. and bears are around Please. every corner when you're a nervous system. Thank you. Thank you I will be a nerd anytime. <laughs> it was that Dorkathy. I think it was, and I appreciated <laughs> it. 
So (laughs) here we are. Yeah, your nervous system gets its initial settings, ages zero to seven, right? So we start to learn if I fall and I go to a grown up, will they say, suck it up, buttercup? Will they say, oh no, my poor baby? And like overreact, which then takes away your locus of control, or will they meet you and say, like, oh, mittens, you really, you really banged it up. Come here. You want to cry in my lap? And like provide that safe, attuned landing place for the nervous system. And so that's how the nervous system learns to calibrate itself. So people who grow up in a lot of um, hypochondria have big reactions or completely shut down reactions. Right. Right. Just no effect with, with it. Right, right. Because we learn what's safe in those little moments. So the nervous system gets revved up and it needs to release. It needs to release. It needs to let it out. It needs to not hold that adrenaline inside because adrenaline is poison. Cortisol is poison. These stress hormones that come out when there's the ouch, when there's the scared, when there's the terror, they can't stay inside our body. But the problem is they do these days. Because in the savanna of evolution, we all constantly Constantly, because we used to only have a huge adrenaline rush when an actual legit literal tiger was like coming out of the bush towards our face. But now it's like your mom called, you get that text from your e- from your boss, your ex comments, like sent you a DM, whatever it is, <gasps> adrenaline, right? There's a budget cut at work, adrenaline. And so... Our work, what behooves us as people in this modern moment is to work with our nervous systems to understand what is coded as lion for you, for Jacob, for Maria Victoria, for you, the listener. What's your lion? What are your, what are the 76 things that feel like lion? And how does your particular body want and need support? Like what is the proverbial lap you can cry in? (laughs) So that's so that's step one, right? Is to really identify what means that for you. What is that totally. lion, tiger, bear for you right now today as an adult? Right. So then, uh, how would that look? How do we identify that without triggering, without getting into like this really challenging? Uh, time because I, I think it's daunting and it's scary for a lot of people to go through that process of you know really like listing out all of the things that are challenging for us, right? Totally. And and to be clear, I'm not saying that we need to like put pen to paper and write out like all of the things that upset us, but getting a bit of a handle on it um, gives us this way to look inside to start to ask what our own unmet needs are. So let me back us up. You said, how do we do this without freaking our nervous system out? We start in ventral vagal. So ventral vagal is the safe and social part of the nervous system. It's when your body's energetically regulated, which is a term we're all seeing bantied about on Instagram without any context, but regulated like a a well-oiled machine. There's just enough gas and there's just enough brake right? So you're, you're driving smoothly, but you're not, you've got a break to keep you from going over the cliff. Right. Um, and that's ventral vagal. It's where I am right now. I feel chill, but like I'm jazzed. I'm talking about nerdy stuff with a nerd, right? My nervous system's in a good place. And, um, ventral vagal is where we feel safe where our cognition works optimally, right? We can think goodly. Uh, it's where our heart and lungs and our digestion and our thyroid, our reproductive function is, go- is appropriate and our emotions are balanced. Our energy is balanced. We have joie de vivre, but we're not hyper, right? We're just, <sighs> and so we get that ourselves sounds... there. Yeah. It, it, it sounds so idealistic though. Is that, is that even possible? Yeah, it's all day. Most, I mean, the hu- humans are meant to be in ventral vagal m- most of the time with a, mm-hmm. with a bit of a, with moments of, you know, sympathetic activation, which is fight or flight and dorsal shutdown, which is the freeze response in the nervous system. These are the three main states uh, of polyvagal theory from Stephen Porges. Uh, and it's how our nervous systems run our lives is by moving us through these three states. Um, and it's all a spectrum. Right? Yeah. So most of the time, most of us are in ventral vagal. We're, we're relatively chill with a little bit of adrenaline, a little bit of activation, and potentially a little bit of shutdown as well, right? Which can sound like, oh my God, there's so many things on my to do list. I just have like so much to do. I just have to. 
oh my, I'm sorry. I just got so overwhelmed by my to-do list. I totally forgot what I was talking about. And then we go into door. So we go into that shutdown of like, I'm so maxed on adrenaline. My body yeah. thinks it's better for me Needs to just to feign death, reset. Yeah. right? To shut me down. And so, you know, what I love about your show is that you're so solutions focused and remedy focused. So I, what really behooves us is to find our own way back into ventral vagal and to mm -hmm. keep bringing ourselves back and bringing ourselves back. When we say a nervous system is dysregulated, what we mean is not the like shift into adrenaline because you need adrenaline to put pants on, right? Like sympathetic's not a bad thing. It's getting stuck there. That sucks. Right. And that's chronic anxiety, yeah. chronic worry, right? And then on the other end, dorsal is chronic depression, shut down, checked out. Yep. And so the regulating can be attention to our breath. That can be a really helpful way to come back into ourselves. Because the breath is like um, the barometer of what's going on in the body, right? Yeah, it's the roadmap. It's how you know what's going on because the second you're adrenalized, you're full of adrenaline, your your heart rate's going to go up and your and your breath is going to come up into the top of your chest. Right. Yeah. Which makes perfect sense, right? You're you're set to run from a lion. You're not going to be like, I'm taking super zen deep breaths. <laughs> like that would be quite silly and ridiculous, right? Cuz that you're going to be luncheon meat. Yeah. You don't got time for that. So you no one's got time for that when there's a lion on your tail. Come on now. <laughs> Come on now. So you, we're smarter than that, right? So you you just shared a lot of really great background information, but I want to circle back to this idea of safe space. Um, we talked about, you know, hmm. what that looks like when you're when you're a kid and you have a healthy attachment and you have that, you know, that opportunity. But as an adult, and especially for the listeners of my show who are leaders in the service impact, um, social services space, they, they constantly have, whether it's their team or the clients and community that they serve, um, these really challenging, high stakes, life or death situations that they're surrounded by all the time. And it's, it's really hard, even for the most skilled to not take that on, to not absorb some of that. So, um, so safe space from that context, what, what, what can that look like? So, uh, so many things are coming to me at once. One is working on energetic boundaries, two, mm. nervous system regulation, and three, let's contemplate and discuss whether the taking on has to be a problem. Okay. So I wonder if the low hanging fruit here might not be to start with acceptance of the fact that not a one of us who got into the caring professions did so because we don't care about other humans of course yeah. right we're empathic loving kind i mean your girl's a nurse at the end of the day right yep. like it's not what i do on the day to day but i was a hospice nurse i get it it's your heart um, it's, it's where it, yeah, it's, it's my root, heart right? it's your it's us yeah. right and so while we're working on creating and upholding energetic boundaries that serve us more because i don't want to say better i don't want to bring a judgy word mm -hmm. in but boundaries that serve us and therefore our communities, right? And the, the stakeholders better. What if we started with saying, yeah, you know what? Uh, this, is, this is my 14th 12 hour shift uh, today and I'm exhausted. And I just heard this nightmare, terrible trauma, stress, horror story from this client I love. And you know yes. what? Yeah. I'm Velcro and that just Velcroed onto me. And it's uh -huh. like I have a million lamprey eels coming out of every one of my neurons. So you know what, instead of fighting that fact and shooting on myself that I should have better energetic boundaries, I should have a more regulated nervous system. Why don't we start with just going like, yep, what is? I got, Vel I'm Velcro, it's on me. Mm -hmm. And then working with what is to, to, let's see if we can't, instead of pushing, sort of metabolize and alchemize right on. And, and work with it to transform it, right? So it just seems like a more humane way to approach ourselves and thereby our clients yeah. and the world. I, I really love that. And, um, and that whole idea of, of the, the mindfulness, right? To be present and to accept what is. I had a really right. fantastic interview with um, Megan um, Roden, um, who is a grief um, especially she's like one of the foremost experts yeah. in grief. And, um, she really likes to distinguish between, 
uh, empathy and compassion. And, um, oh, and, yes. and those of us in Huge. this space, it's, it's a hard, fine line to walk. Um, but I think right. to your point, you know, because of course we, we want to be in, in a space of compassion, um, but not uh, have to always. Uh, I'm not saying it's bad to feel to feel the feelings, but if it is doing damage, then not to to always live in that space. But I love that you're saying, let's let's do some pre work there, and mm, mm-hmm. accept the fact if we are in a place of empathetic overload, to do the work to say, hey, that's okay right now, and, and have the intention to work to something that that works better for us. Right, because if not to go Buddhist light on it, we're we're slinging the second arrow into our own tender hearts, right? Yeah. And and we're saying there's and then you know my partner and I joke about the third arrow, which is not the Buddha didn't talk about that, but that's the the being mean to yourself or like treating yourself in poorly yeah. for being upset, shame, like being it. upset yeah. with yourself for being upset. It's creating like a secondary shame on top of the primary shame. It yeah. becomes like a a a lousy, you know, like those cheap ice cream cones that are like not at all ice cream, those swirly flavors. You know what I'm talking about? It's like that, but of shame. And it's just like, you're going to get like, it's just, it's a nightmare and it's probably bad for your blood sugar. Let's be real. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and, and, and the the soft serve kind of looks like poop. Let's be honest. Um, Let's be really real. It does look very poop like, and it just tends to fall off the cones. It's like so many layers of disappointment. (laughs) It's like, why even bother? Instead, just being like, okay, turns out I'm a human and I'm a nurse, I'm a social worker, I'm a community leader, meow, 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 because I care. Right? Yeah. And I don't, and, that's, and that's, I can just that's decide okay that's not be, a problem. That's my superpower. That. And like, I have ADHD, which means I'm an amazing focuser. Give me I a task that. I'm excited about. Dude, you have no idea. I'm a beast. <laughs> So I can I can tell that story and live into that story and see my brain as a superhero powerhouse, mm-hmm. or I can see myself as something to control, as a problem, as something to change. Yeah, you see where I'm going. Well, I, it all becomes know, about that choice, right? It, it, yeah. it does, and that really resonates with me on a deep level as you know, early um, childhood suicide loss survivor, and having mm. you know really grown up in an environment of, of trauma, um, mm, it, yeah. it often for many of us turns inwards, right? Um, I sure. must somehow be flawed or bad. And therefore right. there is something to fix. There is something to, to do. And that's not to say that right. we, we shouldn't do the work. Um, however, accepting ourselves as being okay, how we are as not being broken, um, yeah, is an important first step. I, I love that you are starting with acceptance here. Um, and, and once, once we're sort of have that, have established that you mentioned, um, energetic boundaries and, uh, yes. and one other thing can, so can we talk about like, then what, what comes next once we, once we're working towards this, this safe space? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, part of it is really about I think it needs to start with building trust with ourselves, which for those of us with a history of of depression, anxiety, et cetera, like I get why that's challenging. Like you were just saying, like ask, ask 26 year old me if I should trust me. And she'd be like, (laughs) only if you're stupid. Right. Like, cause whatever, we didn't have that kind of relationship with each other and by each other, I mean me and myself. Right. And so Right. So one of the things that I find super helpful, and this is the part where I'm like, listen, this is going to sound almost insultingly simple, but remember, we were talking not that long ago about how your nervous system is that of an age zero to seven child. Mm -hmm. We're working with the most simplistic understanding of the world. And so the work is often wicked simple. That doesn't mean it's easy, but it's often simple. So just, I hear myself is I guess what I'm saying. So Building that self-trust for me and my clients this is a practice we do every day in my program is about making a tiny promise to yourself and coming through. We call this the minimum baseline. Mm-hmm. And it's, 
I make it something that's generally something you're already doing. Please don't add something to your plate. Oh my, for the love of all things that are good and holy, do not add a task because the task is not the goal, right? Like going for a walk every morning. That's not what we're talking about. So pick something you already do. Like, let's say when you wake up, you drink a glass of water. Mm -hmm. It's a good practice. Relabel that water drinking in your mind as you fulfilling today's promise to you. Mm. And it's neuroscience. Do it and then do it and then do it and then do it. And eventually you start to believe because neuroplasticity, right? You start to believe that you are someone who can trust themselves to do what you said you would do. What a great way to set yourself up for success by starting with something that you're already doing. We're not talking about yes. adding, but rather reframing. God, no. Reframing what, what you're already yeah, doing, yeah, brushing your teeth, yeah, and that, peeing that, when you have to. That does build trust <laughs> because you're because you are saying like, "Hey, no, wait, I I am actually already doing something for me. I'm actually doing this yeah. good thing for me, and look at the benefits of it. Yay, yep. me, go, Team Jake, right? That's that's great, right? Um, yeah. So, and, and your your program is six months long, so. When you're yeah. talking about this this process and, and, yeah. and sort of you know stepping through it, um, you know one 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 step at a time, I think that that's really important to as just a reference to say that like this is not quick work necessarily, and and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's, that's where people struggle a bit at first. They want like the magic pill and the magic, right? The, the silver bullet. It's garbage. To, uh... It's garbage. The, the, the marketing companies yeah, have I mean, lied it's... to us. That's not how life yeah. is. It's not how it works. Yeah. It's not how it works. You know, and if you think again, that like that basic setting in your nervous system took seven years to take shape and now you're in your thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, trying to change it, yeah. you know, you got to give it a hot minute what somatic or body-based practices, which is the core of, of what I do, uh, it's based in slowness hmm. and returning to the body, the primacy of the body, yeah. right? And not just letting our brains run the show because we need to remember that our socialization, our, our conditioning, our survival skills from childhood live in our mind, yeah. right? And the body, on the other hand, holds our deepest wisdom and, and intuition, and when we can come back to the body by slowing it down, and I hear you busy people. I was a primary care provider in FQHC. Like, I get what being like, oh my God, people are dying. Busy means, and we make mistakes when we rush. We are inefficient when we rush. Yeah. And we hurt ourselves when we rush. We don't have good boundaries. We take on more than we can, more than we want to, right? We get resentful, yeah. right? Which is... Uh, um, an act of emotional violence against our constituents, right? To resent them for having needs because we absolutely haven't empowered ourselves to say no. That is unkind, and, and we're not trying to be unkind. We're loving people who do the work we do. And <sighs> and right, we need to pause and slow things down so we can remember that we do the most good towards the best and and the best good for all. When we approach life with a slowness, with presence, yeah. with mindfulness. Well, and that, so that, my favorite, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and that, that, you know, provides that space for that stress cycle to complete, right? You, that's literally where I was going, oh. you genius. Exactly. I love it. <laughs> I was going to bring it back to the physiology because nerds are going to nerd. When we slow down, that allows the adrenaline to biochemically be released from our bodies. Yeah. And we know that adrenaline in the body, I mean, ask anyone who's done a bunch of cocaine, right? It's not good for our nervous systems. Right. It's not good for our cells. It ages us. It destroys our mitochondria. It ages us. It's it's not a good look, right? right. Bio, yeah. Biochemically speaking, uh, our neurophysiology does not like to be revved up or shut down that acetylcholine state of, of shutdown of freeze. Mm -hmm. Our bodies love ventral vagal. It's, it's great. The water's warm. It's the flow, right? Ventral vagal, right? It feels super dope to put it scientifically. Um, (laughs) so, so where was I going here, Jacob? 
I, where I'm going is slowing it down. Ah, and I was going to give two examples if you don't mind. One yeah, please. is one of the best. I have this super clear memory. I went to Haiti right after the earthquake, mm. now over a decade ago. Um, wait, yeah, 2008, uh, eight, 2009. And man, I just remember this one night standing in the ER. We were all sleeping in tents on the tarmac at the Port au Prince airport. And it was such a place that could have been utter pandemonium and it was quiet. Mm. It was cool. It was collected. That ER, like people were coming in with femurs sticking out of places femurs should not even approximate. And the conversation went like this. Hi, looks like you're hurt. We're going to put you in room two. Hey, could somebody take him to room two? Thank you. Beautiful. Like that was the tone and tenor because that's what the attending set, right? It wasn't, like ER on TV, right? It was calm, cool. And you know what? People survived that I feel quite certain would not have had we been in that Mm. rushed, harried state. And capitalism, late stage capitalism has taught us, like you said, to go fast, go do it, productivity. Yeah. But how much more efficient, loving, kind, and humane might we be if we just slow down? I got chills from that. Um, because I mean, it's such a, a visceral example and I, I can't imagine um, that and, and amazing work. Also, what if we were able to capture and transfer that skill to everyday situations, mm. interactions with the, the, the partners and children and Oof. coworkers? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm doing my best over here to do exactly that. And I got to tell you, I mean, I'm a New Yorker from Buenos Aires. <laughs> Speed is in my brain. Right? I'm a like, hey, let's walk Ludo. faster. Let's ah. exactly. Right. <laughs> like I'm a, I'm a, let's go fast. Like that's, that's just, that. that's what I, that's where I come from. Yeah. And so I get that urge and I see the danger in that urge. Yeah. It doesn't actually lead to better outcomes. Right. So so, I mean, if we just, yeah, it just does not lead to better outcomes in any hustle, area of life. Hustle culture is harmful. The, yes. To everyone, including the earth, right? Like, yeah, it just harms all of us and it harms our connection with ourselves and each other. You know, the focus of my work is on emotional outsourcing, which is the term, the umbrella term I use for codependent, perfectionist, and people-pleasing habits which I then defy as chronically and habitually sourcing our sense of safety, worth, and wellness from everyone and everything mm-hmm. outside of us instead of from within. Mm. That made me emotional right? when you just said that. That like that oh, hit something deep in me. Oh, tell me more, sweetness. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's it's just it's interesting because um, you know, we, we were briefly talking pre-show about family dynamics um and and you know yeah. the challenges that we're we're kind of going through right now and it's like this idea of of constantly needing other people to be our source right um yeah how that is the opposite of safe space because people are fallible people are unreliable uh sometimes and if we are always depending on that from others and we can't do for ourselves, then how are we ever going to feel safe? Right. And so it becomes about it recognizing that the, the remedy to codependence isn't independence, it's interdependence. Yeah. So it's living with a deep sense of one's own autonomy and the autonomy of others, which in codependency, we do not recognize other people's autonomy right? We unwittingly seek to manipulate them, control them, sort of manage them, right? Be strategic around what they think and feel about us and what they think and feel. Oh, don't be sad. It's okay. I'll fix it. Instead of like, let the kid be sad. Feel your feels. It's okay. Right? It's okay. It's great. I will hold you, but feel it. And so in interdependence, we learn how to show up for ourselves Mm -hmm. so that we can show up for each other and expect that in a mutualistic, reciprocal way from others yeah. that doesn't obviate our capacity to do it for our, ourselves. It doesn't come from lack. It comes from abundance. So I absolutely I know I can depend on, on my partner to be there for me. 
right? And she can depend on me as well. We've we've yeah. got each other. Yeah. But I don't cling to her because I can't do it for me. You. Yeah. No, I got me. I'm good. Mm -hmm. And it's so dope that if I'm having a rough day, she'll swoop in and take care of it. Yeah, it's got your back. And I'll do the same for her. Right. At, at it's five... it's woof, it's the next level. <laughs> it, it, it really is. And I and I love that. Yeah. Um and earlier I yeah. you know, I didn't mean to say that um people are in, in inherently unreliable. It's just that um people are often I get your point dealing though. with their own stuff. And so they don't always have the wherewithal, the capacity right. if that's our sole source. Um at, at five bridges we right. um we look at relationships very simply with letters and the letter a is um, that that codependent relationship where if one person mm. moves then the other person falls and instead we like to look at the letter h where two people are independent standing on their own but connected and if they move apart then that's okay because each are still able to stand on their own and it's a very it's very simple imagery and yet how often do we forget how to maintain those boundaries you know it's it's so beautiful and i i just i love that visual it's really great yeah i think a lot of times that hustle culture tells us that we need to figure it out on our own because um there is a sense of um a sense of shame around it. Like if we can't figure it out, if we can't do this for ourselves, if we can't get over this, then somehow we're, we're broken or we failed. Right. So I often find that leaders, especially, um, have a hard time asking for help. I think, yeah. I suspect that why you do what you do is because having a guide through that process, having an, uh, an objective third party who is, on your side, um, but not in it with you, um, right, right, is invaluable. It is, and add the Rogerian principle that the guiding nervous system sets the tone for all the nervous systems, right? All the work that I've done to regulate myself yeah. comes into the room, right? So when mm -hmm. leaders are dysregulated, I mean, oof, we see what follows right? On the national political scale, on the yeah. local political scale. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, when your dad starts screaming, the whole house cowers, right? Like it behooves us as leaders to regulate ourselves and yeah. thereby we can, you know, the work I do is to show folks by modeling my nervous system that a nervous system can be in ventral vagal most of the time with appropriate forays out of ventral vagal, you yeah. know, Eight leggeds, for example, not a fan. But um, <laughs> and don't you dare say their their name. They're listening, um, right? <laughs> um, and that when I get dysregulated, I can bring myself back. And so, mm -hmm. because emotional outsourcing is the soup I swam in my entire life, um, I am able to see it in other people in ways they can't see it for themselves. Because again, like we've been talking about. When it's the setting your nervous system got as a we thing, it's it's normalized, yeah. right? Like for me in my 20s, bottling up my feelings, shoving them down, shoving them down, shoving them down, and then having a little rage fit and like throwing a dish in my room was like totally normal. Normal, right? Yeah. Totally normal. Yeah. Right? Being anxious all the time, totally normal. And then being wicked shut down and not feeling my feelings and then people proving and like getting all the degrees and the certifications and the fan, right? Like yeah. tap dancing for my lovability. Totally normal. Totally normal. Did we Until grow up in the same family? Says, are, are we related somehow? So actually Jerry Springer's here to tell you something <laughs> special. You're actually Argentine. <laughs> Yay! Hey, so, da -da -da! Side note, I, I lived in, in Buenos Aires oh, yeah. for a year. You did. Where in Palermo did. did you live? So um, yeah, I know. <laughs> in, like Capital Federal, most um, in Barrio Norte. Um, mm -hmm. I spent some time in uh, Recoleta in um, Palermo, Hollywood. Well, so as mm -hmm. as I spent more time there, I realized more and more what 
what Argentina is and what Buenos Aires is. Um, so my final stop was actually San Telmo. Um, so I, I sort of like, oh, sh- I, I sort of moved. You lived in San Telmo? Yeah. So I moved out of it. Wow. And and was wow. Okay. It, it was it was fantastic. It was one of the that was brave. Most beautiful experience. What year was that? Two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Oh snap! Okay, yeah. That was a that was a minute to be in Argentina. Yeah, I mean, not that we've had like stability since the eighteen hundreds, but you know, well, whatever. But you know what? I had some I had some great friends uh, who who oh, were yeah. locals, um, and yeah. uh, and it, and it really help to have that. And then there was this whole expat community that was really cool. Um, but awesome. yeah, I had just like, there was a you know, big crash here in the States and I basically lost everything and had to go mm. find myself. And I did it there. Um, it's a good so, place for it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was We're beautiful. We're talking about, oh, I'm so glad. We're talking about going back home for a year or two so my partner can improve mm. her Spanish, her nice. castellano. I yeah. aprendí un poco ay, castellano. Ay, ay. Pero necesito practicar mucho más. <laughs> Pero tu acento es fantástico. Gracias, gracias. <laughs> no hay de qué, no hay de qué. Uh, I wish I had my mate. I left it in the kitchen uh, next time. Listen, we'll do this I, again and I'll drink mate. Yeah, yeah, listen. yeah. Listen. Um, you know, I have, can I, can I show you something? Um, well, well. Yeah, okay. yeah. And then well, I got to leave in like a hot second or I'm going to be late to acupuncture. Well, listen, put a, a nice cap on it. Um, oh, but this would also be a cute B-roll. That's true. So before I left, one of my friends gave me this. Should I go get my mate? Yeah, go ahead. Do you see? I can't see you. Oh, shoot. Hold on. Let me turn on. I, don't... <laughs> I love that you're like showing the camera something and I'm like, yo, dude, you're a black square. No disrespect for black squares. Oh, oh my God. Oh, it's a hoof. My grandpa had a hoof. Are that's you a good me? one. This is like yeah, it's the, a good one. The, the for a plant based person to receive this as a gift, I was like, oh, oh um, that's a that's interesting, and it's like oh, yeah. one of my most prized possessions from Buenos Aires. <laughs> Listen, here's the real deal, though, is that we, I think, Argent old school Argentina. Okay, we could talk forever, and I got to go to acupuncture. But what I love is that we do actually respect the cow. Like, if you're gonna do a murder, use every part of it. Meat is no, murder. And, Duh. Of course it is. But, of but course it is. make the ears into coin purses. Make the hooves into mate. Yeah. Like we have yeah. cow carpets here, you know, like yeah, ta- at the, everyone uh, burns tallow candles. What is it? Um, the, the fair, the hippies, um, uh-huh. <laughs> that's, um, like yeah. all of, all of that's available. And, and when you go to the, like, Parisia, like you, yeah. it, it's like it, you use everything. I do respect that. Everything. And, you know, and when I was there, I did, I, I ate morcilla and I ate, you know, all sorts Good. of weird things. Good. Yeah. Good. But. <laughs> As well, you should. I have to try it. Yeah. I love it. Um, yeah, of course. All great. right. Should we wrap up? Yeah. Thank you. It's so funny because when I saw your name um, come through my email, yeah, you... I was like, I wonder. Hmm. I wonder. I wonder. <laughs> yeah. It's a good guess. So you get it. Why I'm like, my name is not Maria. It's not Maria. Oh, the, it's not Maria. The first time I went, um, I went for a casamiento, the mi amiga uh-huh. Sofia Cartoni, and uh-huh. um, and then like ended up connecting with this whole group there, and it was just like it was amazing. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, and oh, we that's wonderful. We ate like you know pizza and empanadas and had Farnetti cook, and like it was. Ugh. It was a good time. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay. I know you got um, All right. Go. So I do have to how. Yeah. So um, can you share your biggest takeaway or lesson for people? Um, what is the number one thing you want them to know leaving, having listened to you today? Um, or what's something that they can do today right now to start this process? Presence. Always, we are in this work because we are driven by love, right? If not, we'd be Fortune 500 CEOs. We're all smart enough. It's not that, right? But we do this work because we are open-hearted animals driven by love. How do we show up in love for the world, for our constituents, for our clients? By being present, in our hearts, in our bodies, by taking that breath and coming into mindfulness, right? 
And that's what helps us to be the most loving at our jobs, mm -hmm. with our partners, with our children, with our parents. We can set boundaries. Yeah. Right? We can we can say what needs to be said with kindness, but direct kindness, not passive aggressiveness, not in by throwing indirects. Right. Yeah. We can show up and be the version of ourself. Yeah, you know, I used to talk about our higher self because everyone's, you know, it got into my head. But I really like the reconceptualization of our favorite self. Mm. So really taking, so maybe that's the takeaway. Take a moment. Maybe next time you're in the shower, like again, you don't have to make a like a separate activity out of it. You don't have to get a babysitter. When you're in the shower, take a minute and start to ask yourself, who is my favorite version of me? Mm. What are they? Mm. How do they talk to their people? Yeah. Right? How do they listen? Do they take things personally and get defensive? Do they bite and jab? Are they rushed and hurried and harried? Yeah. Right? Or do they know that like by sitting down to drink your coffee, you don't spill it on your shirt? Like it's actually more efficient to be mindful. Yeah. Right? So who's your that. favorite version of you and what can you do to make that you a reality? And spoiler alert, it's presence and mindfulness. I love it. Sorry. Thank you. Spoiler. Thank you for that, that Thank beautiful you. sentiment. I really appreciate your time. Um, yes, yeah, you know, such a pleasure. Your expertise and for, you know, for having done the work to be mm. able to bring that to others. Mm. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, I have a present for your listeners. Oh, what? what you got? Is that so exciting? So it is a for free because come on now, uh, it is a suite of nervous system orienting exercises, a boundary meditation, inner child meditation. Mm. It's F R W -E, E. Come on, nice. go get it, and you can get it at victoriaalbina.com slash passion and profit. So it's A N D. Well, you so have, passion and profit. You have a, ha a a specific tag for the show. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll link that in the show notes Cause, too because it matters. Thank you. Right on. My pleasure. And then if folks want to follow me, you can follow me on the Instagram. I give good gram at Victoria Albina Wellness. My podcast is called Feminist Wellness. And you can learn more about my six-month program, Anchored, Overcoming Codependency, at victoriaalbina.com slash anchored. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Yay. I appreciate My pleasure. This was super duper fun. Let's do it again. Likewise. Thank All right. Well. Thank you. Well, my biggest takeaway from this episode, or, or rather... My biggest next step from this episode is to really solidify a picture of my favorite self. I would encourage you to do the same thing as Maria Victoria suggested, uh, you know, when you're in the shower or taking a drive, working out, um, or just take a, a quiet moment to yourself and conjure that picture of your favorite self. What do they look like? What do they sound like? What does it feel like to be in their skin? And once you have brought that, that image or that memory to mind, remember that that's you. It's always been you. It is in you. They are in you and ready at any time to come forth. It's a matter of reconnecting, being present, like Maria Victoria said. Having that image and having something to work towards is, I think, really important. Sometimes the journey can be challenging, can be discursive, and that's where having a guide can be very helpful. So uh, whether that's me and my team at Five Bridges or Maria Victoria or a therapist or a mentor, I would encourage you to reach out for that type of support. We all need it. Leaders especially need that impartial third party who is on our side, who can offer perspective and help us find that favorite version of ourselves. I'm curious to know what your biggest takeaway from this episode is. Uh, and I'm curious to know what your favorite version of yourself looks like. I'm, I'm going to do some more work on this and I, I'm going to share it with you all uh, on social media, where, wherever you are. Um, if you could comment uh, and let, let us know what that looks like to you. Um, I'm curious. I'm really curious to know. Uh, well, that's it for today. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. And until next time.